for degree 2t polynomial p that approximates the function f. So this means that uh, it is a distance at most one third on all inputs in the domain. And it's bounded between zero and one for all inputs, uh, for all possible inputs. So it's uh, quite uh, an important condition here. So it's actually, it says that if you run your algorithm on an input outside of your domain, you have no guarantees, but it's still an acceptance probability should be a real number between zero and one. Okay, so these are two conditions. Okay, and so um, if you can prove that there is no such polynomial, then you immediately get that there is no t query quantum algorithm that uh, evaluates the function f. Okay, and uh, this condition here can be expressed as a dual polynomial using standard uh, linear programming duality. So we'll, I will come uh, back to dual polynomials shortly. Okay, and the second method, uh, it's um, the adversary method. And so this is a version, it's a general adversary method. So called is version due to Hoyer, Lee, and Spalik. Okay, and um, in this case, uh, I assume that there is an uh, x times y matrices. So remember, x and y were positive and negative inputs, respectively. Okay, so there is an adversary matrix gamma, like with rows labeled by x and columns labeled by y, and uh, which I called uh, uh, derived mat matrices gamma j for each j in n where n is the number of input variables. Okay, and so this matrix is satisfied two conditions. So the first, uh, the second condition is easier. So the spectral norm of each gamma j is bounded by one. So it's kind of a normalization condition. And the first condition is more tricky. So it says that gamma j agrees to gamma on all uh, pairs x, y. Uh, well, now x, y is not equal, uh, x, j is not equal to y, j. So this means that you can get gamma j from gamma just by changing, only by changing entries with coordinates x and y, where x and y agree on the j's uh, input variable. So it's kind of, this means that uh, you can change the variables which are not seen by the query because the query, the j's variable, you'll get equal results in x and j. So that's the x and y. So that's the, like the intuition why, why it works. Okay, then you can prove that uh, any quantum algorithm distinguishing X and Y uh, with bounded error makes omega spectral norm of gamma queries to the input string X or Y. Okay, and uh, so let me compare the two methods. Uh, so they're somewhat complementary. So there are problems with um, easy lower bounds by the polynomial method. So um, examples could be collision. So it's uh, was proven by Aronson and she. And also k distinctness. So k distinctness is a kind of interesting, more recent developments where there were like uh, improvements, um, like using uh, special as a dual polynomial method. And it's still not uh, tight, a lower bound, but it's very close to being tight. Okay, and vice versa, there are problems were much easier, where adversary method is much easier than the polynomial method. That the, for instance, the not end tree, which was proven by Ambrinis, uh, like by a very simple adversary argument, and it took like 10 years to develop the polynomial level bounds. And for say, for the K-sum problem and for left triangle problem, the polynomial level bounds um, are not known as far as I know. Okay, and um, Another important condition that uh, observation is that the adversary method is tied for bounded error. So that means that in principle, you can, for any function, you can find uh, tight adversary level bound that gives the precise lower bound, uh, while the polynomial method is probably not. Okay, and so <clears throat> uh, let me st state the result. So in theory, saying, since the adversary method is tight, there ought to exist an equally strong adversary lower bound for each polynomial lower bound, just by like utilizing this theorem. Uh, but uh, there was known, not known like direct connection, like direct construction of how we obtain this adversary lower bound. Okay, in this talk, I will explain a very simple uh, direct mechanical way of transforming a dual polynomial into an adversary lower bound. And so if you take a dual polynomial, can I actually see 
say that, okay, you can prove that consider it as, as a polynomial row bound, but now you can also consider it as an adversary row bound of a very specific form that I will explain shortly. Okay. And so the motivation for this is that this should allow a possible combination of the two methods and gives a better understanding of both adversary method and the polynomial method. Okay, so let me go uh, shortly through the proof. So first, I will return to dual polynomials. So I will not define them in formula, I will just explain them. Okay, so remember we had this task of distinguishing uh, two sets of inputs, capital X and capital Y. Okay, and um, so this degree T that was a lower bound that the dual polynomial gave. So it can be this uh, winner optimization problem can be expressed in the following way. There exist two probability distributions, mu and nu, uh, with the joint supports uh, tilde x and tilde y, with the following two properties. First, they are well correlated with x and y respectively. Okay, so I will not define what well correlated mean, but um, okay, it's easy to define. Okay, and the second condition is much more interesting. So this, uh, it says that uh, two, these two probability distributions are perfectly indistinguishable by assignments of size not exceeding t. Okay, so this means that uh, if you take an assignment alpha of size t, this means that you fix the values of t of your input variables. So you, someone gives you any t elements from a string, sample from mu, or sample from nu, they have exactly the same probability in both distributions. So this means that given the value of these t elements gives you absolutely no information whether your input is sampled from new or your input is sampled from mu. And so let me note also that uh, this condition of having um, like indistinguishability by assignments is also used in classical lower bounds quite extensively, uh, but there there is no uh, condition of being perfectly indistinguishable, like somewhat indistinguishable uh, uh, distributions are st still are going to give lower bound. But in the quantum case, uh, as this is demonstrated by this dual polynomial, we really need this perfect indistinguishability. Okay, so and we will see how this is used in the in the adverse lower bound. Okay, so the consequence of what is written here is that. Um, it suffices to find a matrix um, uh, gamma prime for distinguishing these new sets uh, tilde, uh, tilde gamma for distinguishing tilde x and tilde y. And then we can get the matrix gamma for distinguishing x and y just by restricting uh, this gamma tilde to the, uh, to, the in, to the inputs that are allowed. Okay, and you can, it's not too hard to prove that this still, still gives a Good lower bound, because uh, for instance, derived matrices will have norm less than one because this is a sub matrix. And you can also prove using correlation that this new matrix still has a good uh, lower bound, a good, like a large spectral norm. Okay, and so I can, uh, uh, can restate the problem. And so I'm now going to talk about the following problem. So we have two probability distributions, mu and nu. And now I removed tildes because um, okay, I just have X and Y. So two disjoint sub subsets. And that uh, the same conditions are perfectly indistinguishable okay, by assignments of size at most two T. Then uh, there exists an adversary matrix gamma for distinguishing X and Y with the norm equal to T plus one. So now I will explain how, how I get this matrix gamma. Uh, that was gamma tilde on the previous slide. I just uh, stripped gamma, all tildes because I won't need them anymore. Okay, how, so this is the technical part of the argument. Okay, this slide exactly. So, uh, so I take an assignment alpha of size that doesn't ex, uh, exceed t. So this means I fix at most t input variables. Okay, and I define two vectors like in the set um, with uh, input bases given by the, well, by the, with bases given by the inputs. 
Okay, so the first one, okay, I am sampling from mu, like all the elements which agree with the assignment alpha. Okay, and I'm putting a square root as usual. Like mu is a probability to get an amplitude by taking a square root of the probability. And uh, V uh, gamma is the same thing I'm taking mu, which is supported on gamma. Yeah, such two uh, vectors. Yeah, and uh, so the next, so the main idea <coughs> of the argument is uh, this equality here. Okay, so what is uh, what is said here? So here is the inner product between these types of vectors. So um, if you think about this, well, this means that this, this can be written as a probability as x sampled from mu, uh, the input agrees both to alpha and assi assignment alpha and assignment beta, okay, because um, these are the only, uh, so this condition means uh, that they are non-zero here, okay, and if they are both non-zero, then uh, they both have square root of mu x, they are multiplied, okay, and you get m of x, so it's the sum of m of x becomes. Okay, and uh, by perfect indistributability, okay, you can take a look what this means, so this means here that either that x um, alpha and beta are either contradictory, in which case the, the probability is zero. If they are not contradictory, they give an assignment of size at most 2t. By perfect indistinguishability, uh, we have the same probability for, for nu, okay? And by the same argument, this is the inner product between uh, v uh, y's. Okay, and so we have inner product equal to inner product. Hence, for each k that which is less than t, for each integer k that is less than our bound t, there exists an isometry, uh, w at most k, that maps all v alpha x into v alpha y for all alpha of size at most k. So it's a well-known result. So inner products agrees, there exists an isometry. Okay, and also assuming that zero on the orthogonal complements on the of the span of these factors here. Okay, so this actually is the main result why we need perfect indistinguishability to obtain this isometry here. Okay, and so the Dressel matrix is just the sum of this isometries. Well, as, as easy as that. Okay, and uh, let me sketch why, why this works. So, um, so by definition, isometry uh, W at most K maps V alpha X into V alpha Y. Okay, and if I am uh, allowing assignments of large and larger size, I get more and more vectors in my span. Okay, so I have this, uh, this inclusion here, this chain of inclusions, where I mean, what I mean here, that there are isometries and the domain of this isometry is contained in the domain of this isometry and they agree on their common domain. Okay, so I can say this is an inclusion if I consider them as pairs of my piece. And uh, from this, I get this uh, this matrix gamma, which is the same matrix as on the previous slide, has norm t plus one, which is attained on w at most zero. This thing, because it's contained in all these subsets, in all these my piece. So it's counted t plus one times in this sum. Okay, I can even see what is the spectrum this matrix gamma. So the spectrum it has like all integers from zero to t plus one. Okay, and um, like um, the second condition, I have to show that the derived matrix C, matrix gamma J has norm at most one. So here is the idea that I define a slightly different isometry W prime, that which is at most uh, at most K. Okay, and so this uh, the same definition. So it maps V alpha X into V alpha Y, but for all assignments of, of size of most K that fix the value of J. So I'm only considering assignments where the value of the variable J is fixed. So I, I know that this value, the, the value of this variable is given to me, this assignment. Okay, and as before it's zero on the orthogonal complement of these vectors. Okay, and uh, so the first claim is that uh, it satisfies this condition. So this is a direct sum or, or block diagonal matrix. So it's zero, the interest is zero, but now xj is not equal to yj. 
Why? Because uh, alpha fixes J, and so if I have a fixed value of J here, it's mapped to the same fixed value of J here, so it doesn't go outside of the subspace. So for J equals all the vectors with J equal to seven are mapped to the vectors with J equal to seven, so they, they are waving Z block. So it's the sum of isometries becomes uh, along the diagonal, so it's a block diagonal matrix. Okay, and the second claim uh, that this uh, primed uh, isometries intervene, intervenes in this chain which I had previous. Okay, so this uh, inclusion is easy to see because I'm having the same size, but I have additional restriction on the assignments which I take. So this means that uh, this isometry is smaller than this isometry. But on the other hand, you can also prove this inclu inclusion because you can write uh, every isometry of size, say one, as a sum, uh, which doesn't fix J, as a sum of uh, assignments where you fix J just by taking the sum over all possibilities of J. So, uh, so assignment where you don't fix J, you can write as a sum of this where alpha X, where alpha fixes J, but just going through the sum for possible uh, values what X, J can take. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Okay, and therefore, the derived, I can do, define the derived matrix like this. Okay, so this is original gamma. Okay, I am subtracting this uh, primed thing because of this condition here, it's uh, a valid adversarial matrix. So it's, I'm only changing the entries where x, j is equal to y, j. Okay, and uh, on, so this is written here. Okay, and on the other hand, the norm of this matrix is one uh, because it's an isometry from perpendicular subspaces. So, okay, so this is, uh, say, W0, or should be at most zero, sorry, is here. And for instance, this thing, so it's, uh, say, uh, less equal to one and prime less equal to one. So this is a difference. So this means it lives in the orthogonal complement of this, of the, of the domain here. So it's orthogonal to W0. So the domain of this isometry is orthogonal to this thing. Okay, so, uh, so they are, have orthogonal domains, so the, the, and they are all isometries, so their norms are one. Okay, so that's uh, the whole proof. Okay, and so to summarize, so we have shown that the dual polynomial is an adversary bound of a very specific form, and this specific form is really based on having this perfect indistinguishability. Uh, because as soon as, as we don't have this perfect indistinguishability, so it becomes much more harder to show that the norm is um, behaves as it should behave. Okay, and um, so this, but this is also like um, one observation that raises a lot of questions, which are open and um, can be discussed. Okay, so can this firm be generalized to obtain a more convenient version of lower bound based on dual polynomials? So this means, can we somehow generalize so we know that dual polynomial is a diversity bound of very specific form. Can we somehow relax this form and get something a more uh, a stronger lower bound technique? Okay, can we explain when and why polynomial method becomes non-tight? So we know that diversity method is tight. So this means that um, whether we, maybe we can see that why lower bounds of this specific form fail. Okay, maybe you can give reverse directions from a polynomial method to adversary method for some specific cases. Okay, when we can show that we can assume without loss of generality that this specific form works. For instance, we know that there is a collision problem and we suspect that K distinctness are in this class. Okay, so we could show use this perfect indistinguishability, as I said. So can non-perfect distinguishability can be used of any help? So it's a very interesting problem, I think, and uh, I don't really have a way to address this. Could be very, could be very interesting to solve this. And uh, finally, can this be generalized to completely bounded forms, so which is a generation of a polynomial bound? Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Any question?
Yes, thanks for the nice talk. So I have a question about the part of completely bounded forms. Yes. So in that case, it would be in principle possible to also go the other way around, right? From adversary matrix to a completely bounded form. Yes, yes, uh, completely bounded forms are known to be tight. So there should be conversions in both directions. Right. Yes, you're right. Is there any hope that you can find a construction that maps an adversary matrix to a completely bounded form? Uh, I think it's possible. Yes, I don't, I don't know. I haven't worked on that too much. Any other question? Uh, thank you. I was wondering, um, you know, you mentioned that some problems um, are easier to lower bound with the polynomial method versus the adversary bound. I was wondering if you think that this mapping um, might inform us on how to construct adversary matrices um, that are, I don't know, nicer or easier to analyze uh, for problems that have been historically difficult like element to sickness uh, with small alphabet size, um, or if just, um, you know, there are new ways of thinking about constructing bounds, like starting in the adversary method. Uh, I think, yes, that uh, what I said on my last slide that both of these things uh, are valid. So uh, this could give like you can get, you can take a look at the adversary bounds that you get from this dual polynomial, and maybe you can see how to, you can you can do something with this. Maybe you can combine them in various ways so that it's uh, not from a dual polynomial, but it behaves similarly in a way. So, but even if you take uh, like uh, lower bounds for case sum and left triangle, so they use a similar ideas of indistinguishability and extension but the difference is that uh, they also have like a, a more structure to them. So it's quite possible that you can take this uh, ideas of having structure and add these powerful techniques of uh, dual polynomials to get something interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I was wondering um, if the polynomial method can be used in principle to um, general state conversion problems and where this work would fit in, in this direction. Uh, yes, you can certainly use polynomial method for general state conversion. For instance, there are results that are very easy to prove, for instance, uh, that you can, it's hard to generate a state of the firm like which is 99% zero and 1% parity. So we can easily prove that uh, you have to use a uh, winner number of queries to generate the state. Just it just follows from polynomial message just uh, almost instantly. But uh, for, for the additive adversary, you can prove that you cannot prove this whole amount. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, you can use it, but um, uh, I'm not aware like of a general uh, of a general formulation of this technique that would be similar like for state conversions for the adversary method. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank speaker again. Okay.